Yeah, I'm going to go and state this up front as we get ready to get in this message. I'm going to be talking this morning. We've kind of been in this theme and in this time of talking about the end times and uh, getting ourselves ready. The last couple of weeks we were talking about how we should be living in the end times. And I shared with you last Sunday that this morning I'm going to be teaching, this will be more of a teaching than anything else, as to why our position as a church, when I say our church, I mean not only Parkway Life Church of God, but as a denomination, over 7,000 churches globally in the United States and globally around the world, 7,000 churches are part of our association, our church family, you can call it a denomination, I know people don't like that word, but our position is we believe in what we call the pre-tribulation period. And I'm going to talk to you about that. I'm going to explain some things, but I'm going to go and tell you up front. I will leave you this morning asking more questions than questions that I will answer. And if I've done that, I've done a good job, to be honest with you. If, the, if, if, if you are listening and you are receiving this, then it's probably going to stir up a lot of questions in you. And that's a signal to you to get in, jump in and find out what it is that you need to hear, what it is that God wants to speak to you about concerning the end times. Now, uh, the other thing I want to go ahead and say up front about this teaching, because I, I understand that in the audience there may be people who you take a different position. And there's actually four different tribulation positions that seem to be the most common amongst the church and amongst the church family. Uh, and I say church, I don't just mean Parkway, I mean just the global church. And we'll, we'll hit on those in just a minute. Uh, some people don't believe in pre-trib. Some people believe in what's called mid-trib, post-trib, or pan-trib. And we'll get in that in just a second. Or there may even be some five or six other ones too. But let me just say this to you. That it's not a heaven or hell issue. Okay? If, if, if what I even believe is, is wrong as it relates to interpreting the time frame of both this, the rapture and the second coming and this period of tribulation, great tribulation, whether the Lord returns at the beginning of the tribulation, the middle of the tribulation, the end of the tribulation, somewhere in between, um, your belief on that is not going to determine where you spend eternity, okay? So, and I tell you the thing that I've come to recognize, especially as it relates to studying eschatology and end time scriptures. This is so much a mystery. In fact, the prophet Daniel, I was studying Daniel this week, and the prophet Daniel, as he's praying this prayer and giving this interpretation of the vision that he gives, gives us the future events both in Jerusalem and their day and the days to follow his time and then the, the end times, then it's, it's so fascinating to know that there's probably... Even Daniel himself was confused about trying to determine and understand exactly what it was that the Lord was trying to speak to him and to try to get written down and penned as far as prophecy. So this morning, I just want to say up front that, that this is one of those things that as mysteries, as God reveals certain mysteries at certain times, then we have to understand and be aware that some of those mysteries are going to not come into light and come into to fruition until we get to a particular time that God has released that revelation. So that's why there's a lot sometimes of confusion. That's why there's a lot of questions as it relates to uh, the interpretation, especially of eschatology and end times. And so, so as we move forward in these times and we begin to experience the changes of things, then God is going to begin to reveal certain things that were written that were blinded to us because he did, not want to understand, he did not want us to understand it in that time, but yet he's going to make those things known and make those things common, specifically to the body of Christ and the church. So that's where we're going this morning. So what I want to do is before we even get jumped in into the verses and breaking this down, I'm going to, I, want, I got to share some what I think is some very basic things that some of you probably know, but I don't think that everybody knows because there hasn't been a lot of teaching and preaching on eschatology in the end times and until recently in the last few years, then you're hearing more of this. And I think there's a lot of Christians who, what I would say are mature Christians that are actually struggling with really putting all of even some of the simple and the basic things together. And those are the things I want to talk about. So here's where I want to start with this, is I, I want to start with re-emphasizing that the rapture and the second coming are not the same thing. Now, we, we sometimes use terminologies, you know, I can't wait for the Lord to return, I can't wait for the Lord to come back, can't wait for, you know, the rapture. And, and I think there are some Christians who put these two events as one thing, and we're just describing it in two different ways. But you need to be aware that the rapture and the second coming are not the same event. They are two separate events. And, and I'm going to show you. There's going to be something I'm going to throw up on the screen in just a minute to show you 
some things that will be happening when the rapture takes place, at the time of it, and after the rapture takes place, but then the second coming. And the difference is, and I'll just go and say this up front, the difference is when the rapture happens, when God takes the church out and he raptures us and gets us out of here, we are meeting Jesus on the clouds. And this is a very instant event. This happens in the twinkling of an eye. It is, it is so quick, you, you, can't even, you, can't even, you can't even contain the quickness of this. And we will be caught up together, as, as Paul says, in, in the clouds to meet with the Lord. Christ will rise first. So a lot of events are going to happen within just, just a split second. Jesus does not step on the earth at that time. He, it's not until later that we experience the second coming, which a lot of that is mentioned in the prophecy that's mentioned in, 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 in Matthew 24, where he actually steps on the earth. So I want to clear this up. So I know sometimes we do say, well, you know, I can't wait for the return of the Lord and those kind of things. And, and so we need to understand that the rapture and the second coming are two different things. So I want to start by just first speaking for just a moment about the rapture itself. And I know some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. So, so why do we call that? Well, actually, in the English language, it's not in our English Bibles. But the actual word in the Greek word uh, is a word harpazo, which basically means to be caught up or catching away or the snatching away. It is that, that, that's what the writers mention in Scripture when they talk about the rapture. It is, it is the snatching away. And so the word in the Greek is Harpazo, the word in the Latin is rapturo, which is where we get the word rapture. So there's many emphasis in scripture. In fact, these are just some of the scriptures here that I've provided for you. I know some of you are going to be taking your phones out and taking pictures of these, and that's, that's okay if that's what you're doing for word study, and I encourage you to do that. But these are just some of the scriptures that give us the interpretation or the, 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 the scripture defining the event of the rapture. Now, the second coming, as I said a moment ago, is different. And here's just some of the scriptures. This isn't all of them. These are just some of the scriptures that speak and define the second coming. The entire chapter, just pretty much, of, of Matthew 24 describes that particular time. And so when you study scripture, and you're studying both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you're reading things, it's easy to think, okay, these are signs that are going to happen before the rapture. Well, let me just go and say this now. There are no signs for the rapture. There are no signs, no warning signs for the rapture. There are hundreds of prophecies and signs and signals of the second coming. And so that's why we have to make sure, and that's one reason why in this position of pre-tribulation, we are making sure that we keep our hearts ready. So, so when we look about this, here, here's the other thing that I want you to think about. There are multiple, multiple uh, denominations, different kinds of churches, and what is unique is pretty much all Bible-believing churches all around the world and denominations all believe in the teachings of the rapture and the second coming. The, pretty much all of them, in fact, all of them do, that you won't find any Bible-believing teaching doctrine or denomination or church that doesn't preach about the rapture and doesn't preach about the second coming, okay? What is not agreed upon and what is sometimes confused in the interpretation is actually the timetable of these things. When's the rapture going to take place and when's the second coming going to take place? There's several different positions of this time. And the other teachings have to do with the seven-year period, the seven -year period that we'll talk about in just a minute, specifically in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and about the book of Revelation that is considered what we know as the tribulation and the great tribulation. So let me just quickly give you, just so you know, because you may still be trying to determine what, what is my position. Or maybe you've never even thought about this, and you actually probably fall in, in, in this new definition, which is called pan-tribulation. But let's just talk about this. First of all, here's what pre-tribulation, this is position one. Pre-tribulation doctrine is they believe that the rapture occurs at the beginning of a seven-year tribulation period. And, and some of that, and we'll get into that in just a moment, that's, that's where a lot of Daniel chapter 9, Ezra, Je, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, there's so many scriptures, both Old and New Testament, that speak about, it gives us this teaching of what is called a seven-window period of tribulation. So, so those that take the pre-tribulation doctrine, which is what I believe, which is what our denomination as a church of God believes, we believe that the rapture will take place and signal from that point the next seven years the world will enter into a time called tribulation, okay? Now, the second group, and I'll just say this, all of these different positions, have biblical, uh, they have biblical foundation. 
And again, that's because the word of God has such mystery that we're trying our best to interpret, even with the Holy Spirit, the timetable of several of these events. And so the second position is mid-tribulation. And these are those who created a belief and a doctrine on Scripture, their interpretation of Scripture, that the rapture occurs somewhere in the middle of that seven years because it's broken down in Daniel chapter 9, what's called three and a half good years, three and a half bad years, 48 months, 48 months. These are, these are two windows of period and that there will be the, the first uh, three and a half years of tribulation, which will be hardships, but then the second three and a half years is going to be a very difficult time because there's going to be, they believe that the rapture will take, take place in that time. The church, the Holy Spirit will be out of the earth. And so the enemy will have chaos and reign, which he will in that specific time in the, in the end of the three, and a half, the three and a half years. The third position is called post-tribulation doctrine. And these are people who believe that the rapture occurs at the end of the seven year period, followed quickly by the second coming of the Lord. So here's what they believe. They believe that we are all going to be in the tribulation, that saints and sinners alike are all going to be in this seven-year period that is, and everyone agrees on a tribulation period. Uh, of all those doctors and scholars and, and church denominations that teach this, they all believe that there's going to be a tribulation. But the post-trib doctrine believes that the church will be here during both the, great, the tribulation, which is the first three and a half years, and then the great tribulations, which is the last three and a half years. Now, the reason that I... And, and so, so keeping in mind with that doctrine, then two things have to happen real quick at the end of the tribulation. The rapture has to take place, and then the Lord has to come back down for what is known as the second coming to begin to establish the work that he's going to do in that, in that particular time and regain control over the nations, gather the nations, and, and, uh, and get the, to get the, get the, the, uh, bring the end to the, the sin and the abomination of the world and bring full judgment to the world and bring the destruction of the world. So, so that's that position. And that's, to be quite honest with you, I struggle with that position even when I look at scriptures because it just does not biblically make sense to me how that God would align that plus scriptures you'll see in just a minute where the Lord has already promised us that 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 last the end of that tribulation those three and a half years are considered the times of judgment and wrath and the Lord has made it very clear and I'm going to read those at the close of this message that God has promised to keep us from the wrath we're going to be preserved from that wrath so that's why we believe in this position that the church will be raptured and we will not be here especially in the great tribulation okay so these are just the and then the fourth position just in case is what's called the pan tribulation doctrine okay and that is basically a belief that there is no certainty or clarity of what point the rapture occurs within the seven year period therefore the believer simply lives ready and does not concern themselves with interpreting the timeline okay and, and to be quite honest with you, you know, that's really kind of how we had to live anyways, okay, by faith. We really, we, we, we believe and we trust God, and my position is that the rapture is going to take place at the beginning of the seven years, and then when we have three and a half years, that's going to be tribulation, and then three and a half horrendous, horrible years of tribulation will, will bring the destruction. And, and so, but we have to live ready no matter what. And we have to be ready to, 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 to be caught up in the clouds with the Lord for that great rapture. So whatever your position is, then, then one thing for sure is you just need to be ready. Everybody say, I'm going to be ready. Okay? Now, I told you a moment ago, this is not a heaven or hell issue. And I just want to remind that again, because I don't want you to think, oh my goodness, what if I believe the wrong doctrine? What if I'm accepting the wrong thing? And if I'm wrong... Well, if you're wrong, thank God for the grace of God. It's all going to play out in the end when it comes down to it, okay? Here's the reason that I feel it's important that I share this message with you this morning, though. Because if our position is a pre-tribulation doctrine, and we understand that there are no biblical warnings of the rapture, then this simply tells me, without a doubt, the rapture could actually take place any time. ...of the, great tri the tribulation and the great tribulation. And I love the way Dr. David Jeremiah shared it two weeks ago in our video series, which, by the way, if you're not coming on Wednesday, you ought to be here for this. This is, I mean, it's a continuation of some things that I'm sharing. But he says that when, when prophecy is given, it casts a forward shadow. So when something is spoken in prophecy for a specific time, it will, it will cast a shadow of things, and that shadow will be a forward shadow. 
So the things that we read in Matthew chapter 24 and other places in Scripture, specifically Daniel and the, on the entire book of Revelation pretty much, those things, while they speak a lot about the end times, specifically the seven-year period, and then after that and the, the thousand-year millennial reign and all of that, when those, the, the warnings of those things, while they're meant for a certain time, they cast a forward shadow. In other words, it gives us a sense that we're getting close to that. And when I read the warnings of the end times, of things that will happen during the tribulation. There's no doubt in my mind that we are seeing the alignment of these things and we're beginning to see that the world is being conditioned and set up for these things to happen. This is why I believe that we should be ready and we should be getting the church ready. I'm gonna also pause and say something here. There are probably Christians even in this room that you believe it. You don't doubt that the Lord is coming. You don't, you don't doubt that, that um, there's going to be a rapture. There's going to be a second coming of the Lord. You don't doubt the teachings of the scripture. But what I felt in my heart in praying over this specific message is that there are people that you are also seeing the warning signs, but you have somehow got your idea that before the rapture takes place, it's actually really going to get bad. And when it does, that's when you're going to go ahead and decide to get ready. Let me tell you something. Don't make that mistake. Don't think, well, I still have time. Because there's still some things that I think that have to happen before the Lord blasts the trumpet and he calls the saints away. The other thing that I also want to mention for that person who or you are gambling with your soul and you are thinking, well, I'm staying close enough just so that way if it really gets bad, it will make it easier for me to jump back into a serious commitment with Christ. Then I want to tell you something. You don't want to take that position. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, if I do miss the rapture, I'll just tough it out during that tribulation. I'll refuse the mark of the beast. I'll refuse the influence of the Antichrist and the spirit of Babylon and the earth. And I'll just, at that point, recognize that it is very real. There's no question because if, oh my goodness, I mean, think about if the rapture takes place and one third of the world disappears, vanishes just like that. That's not any type of Hollywood trick photography, but it literally happens and we see it and that's how it's going to play out. Then obviously everybody's going to believe that the prophecies are real and that this thing is very real. If you think to yourself, well, if I do miss it, I still have a second chance. Now, the Bible talks about the very elect will be deceived. And there will be so many people who will be left out who, ha who have the opportunity, who miss their moment. And yes, you can, and yes, you will. And there will be a great revival, especially towards the end of that time of tribulation when the Lord comes back and he brings the prophets and he aligns the nations and he brings one last great revival. But there's going to be so much martyrdom that's going to take place, so many people that will be killed who did not make it in the rapture. And so you are not, it's going to be much harder than what you're sitting here thinking about. If you're thinking, well, I'll just, if I miss it and if I'm not ready. I, here's what I'm trying to say. The time to get right with God is now. The time for you and I to stop playing. Playing with our faith. Playing with our religion. Playing church. And playing with God. The time now is to stop. And to get serious. Because I'm going to tell you. And I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not a scholar and I'm not deeply uh, educated in studying eschatology. This is a lot of work for me to, to just even get to this point where I'm sharing today. And quite honestly with you, I'm just scratching the surface and it's very, very basic. But I will tell you that you can ask almost anyone who is taking serious what God is speaking to his church today. And they are telling you that we will see in our time, this generation, the time of the Lord and the time of the Lord is at hand. And we will see this take place in our generation. So this is why I think it's important. Now for the next few minutes, I want to give you the parallel. Because I just really, these are just some helpful things for you and I to see. We haven't even read a scripture yet. And we're going to read, most of that's going to be the end of this message. And we're working towards that. So stay with me. But for the next few moments, I just want to give you a parallel, a parallel and a comparison. I wish there was a way that I could have actually put these two things on the screen. As far as what will happen at the rapture and what will happen at the second coming. 
because I want you to see the distinctions of these. So let's start by looking at some of the events. If you'll take your attention to the screen, and I want you to look at some of the things that, that the Scriptures talks about and some of the verses that I gave to you as references. These are just several things. These are not all the things, but these are just some significant things that happens at the period or that time of the rapture, which we all believe could happen at any moment. Here's some of the things. Christ will appear in the air for his church. This is the catching up of all the believers that will take place. The church age believers are taken out of the Father's house into heaven. Uh, Jesus talks about this in John when he says, you know, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself that there I am, there you will be with me. So that is where the Lord, that's the, that's the church age where the believers are taken out of this earth and we are taken to the Father's house. There is no judgment on the earth that takes place at the rapture, okay? The church is physically gathered together with Jesus. And only the rapture is taught as being imminent, okay? It is a sudden thing, and it is the only thing that is taught will be a sudden thing that will happen to the believer, okay? There are no signs preceding it. We've, we've pretty much cleared that. We've covered that. There are no signs to tell us of the rapture, okay? The rapture will involve only the believers. Only those who are in Christ will actually be the ones affected by the rapture as far as taken in the rapture, okay? Uh, the, it is a time of great joy and rejoicing. So when that happens... Now, not on the earth, but those who are gathered in the clouds, and then we are from the clouds taken into the heavens with God, and we're there in our Father's house. There's gonna, this is going to be a great time of, of rejoicing. This is going to be a great time of celebration. The rapture happens before the tribulation period, and that's what we're teaching, and that's what we're understanding today. There's also no mention of Satan in the rapture. There's nothing mentioned about where he's going to be and what his strategy is going to be at that moment, quite simply because we don't know that moment. But we also know that the Satan is always present. He's always at work. And he's certainly, he doesn't even know the time. You understand that. Satan does not know when the rapture is going to take place. He doesn't know these things. But he knows the warnings and he knows the scriptures that it's going to happen. In fact, he believes more about it than some, some, some church people do, to be honest with you. Only those looking for him will see him. Only those who are waiting expectantly for him will be the ones that will enter into this. And at that point, this is the signal, the beginning of the seven years, the tribulation. Okay, The rapture takes us to what is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we are there as the bride with the bride. And that is, a, that is sort of a great wedding feast that we will experience in heaven. And this is a metamorphosis to all believers. We are all going to instantly be changed. Our bodies are going to be changed. We're going to be given new bodies. We're going to be taken out from this body. And, and we're going to be caught up and raptured into heavens. And God will, will give us new bodies. So, so your prescriptions are not going to go with you. Your cane is not going to go with you. You won't need your glasses or your contacts. How about that, right? Okay. You won't have to get up and stretch in the morning and, and you know... You, you, all those things, you know, isn't it funny how when your body starts breaking down, you actually start developing physical habits that you don't even know you're doing, and it's just because it's just part of what you got to do to function. You know, uh, it, all those habits will be broken off. All those things, you know, you know how, like if you got a bad hip, you're careful when you're walking up steps or those kind of things, or you got a bad knee. Uh, it, you, you're not going to have to worry about any of that stuff. And that when I talk about the celebration and rejoicing, you are going to be jumping, dancing, shouting, probably trying to fly around, and you probably will get to do that. If you got wings, however, I don't know how that's going to look all there, but this is the part of what it's going to be like. And this is, this is, this is the rapture. This is the rapture. This is something that we believe strongly that we're getting ready to experience. Now, the second coming, and again, I wish I could have put these two things side by side because you will see a lot of parallel how they're different. But here's, here's some of what the second coming looks like is Christ returns the earth, the earth with his church. So at the second coming of the Lord, which is the end of the tribulation, then when he comes, he'll be coming back. And at this point, he will not be stepping on a cloud. He will be stepping on Mount Zion. He will be coming down on the holy hill of God and he will be returning with his church. No one is caught up. In the second coming, okay? All believers, our believers are not taken to the Father's house from heaven. We're actually coming from there down on the earth because this is where Christ judges all the inhabitants of the earth. Jesus Christ gathers the nations on the earth to judge. The second coming happens in the last seven years. There are hundreds of signs preceding to the second coming. The second coming affects all of humanity. The second coming is a time of violence and it is a time of fear for those who do not know the Lord. It happens immediately after the tribulation period uh, because we know that the beginning of the three and a half years is a hardship, but the second half of the, this tribulation, which is the great tribulation, is going to be the most violent, difficult time. But it is at this point, part of what Jesus comes to do 
is to bound to bind up Lucifer once and for all and cast him into eternal destruction where he will never be able to do anything else again. It is also at this point that every eye, every person will be able to see him. This is the end of the tribulation. Jesus Christ and his bride are seen descending, and there are no metamorphoses described at all in this event. There's not going to be any changed bodies or anything whatsoever. This is an incredible time. This is the second coming of the Lord. Now, here you have this, these two events, and I almost want to look at them as bookends, and then you have in the middle of this what we know as the seven-year period of tribulation. That is probably the area that has the most question and confusion when it comes to timeline. A lot of the things that's spoken in that, those events are not argued. Those events that are told that are going to happen, really no one is disputing what the scriptures say are going to happen. Where the, where the question comes in, and where the, I don't even want to use the word argument, but maybe the debate or where the, the difference comes in is when does Jesus come? When does the rapture take place? And specifically, when is the second coming of these events? So, so the seven-year period is really something that, that most everyone believes the events that are described in that period are going to happen. What is the question mark is the actual book ends. When does the rapture take place? When does the second coming take place? Does the tribulation start before the church is raptured? Now, I want to mention to you that, that while there are no warning signs of the rapture, the Bible does speak a lot about some of the things that's going to happen in the, before the end of the age. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 when he talks about a time that is called perilous times. And so I almost want you to envision that there's really three timelines. There's a perilous time, there's a tribulation time, and there's a great tribulation time. The tribulation and the great tribulation is a time that's, that's covered in a seven-year period, which is the time of tribulation. But the perilous times is a time that is just a time where the earth and, and humanity and the culture and the conflict of humanity really begins to increase. So I guess one could argue that these maybe are signs of the time or signs of the return of the Lord. And there are many of those things that Scripture tells us that we do see taking place. When you go look, and I didn't put this in Scripture, but if you go look at Paul's letter to 2 Timothy chapter 3, when he says that in the last days there will be perilous times, and he gives a description of all these difficulties. Men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. Haters, traitors, uh, boast, proud, unbelieving. Uh, so many different descriptions. I think it was like 13 different things, if, I, if, my, if my mind serves correctly, of different things that will be the condition of the world. And he talks about the condition of the church, and he says they will have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Now that statement really struck, that, that stirs within me because I believe that while I don't believe that we are going to go through the tribulation, I believe that we are going to go through perilous times. And this is the reason why I believe that perilous times are very necessary for us to go through. Because difficulty always squeezes out of what's in the inside of you. It will make whatever is in you come out eventually. When you and I are under a certain pressure, eventually what is on the inside of us will come out. Tribulation, or, or excuse me, perilous times and hardships has a way of revealing to us things that we know about ourselves and the things that we don't know. I think probably if I can use that, if I can throw that word that we're trying to get away from, the word pandemic, I think if there's one thing that I think we could say that over the last two plus years under this time of pandemic, it's been somewhat perilous times for us. But I, 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 as you know, I, I have a great connection with so many pastors. I am constantly in contact with pastors and we're having dialogue. We are talking all the time about the events and, and what is become pretty much common for all of us, and you can probably say the same thing, is that what we have come to discover over the last two years is the church is in a deficit when it comes to having the authenticity of the authority and the power of God. Uh, call them back. Just tell them we'll reach back to them. Okay. Listen, we, 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 we see already, we already see and we already know, and I think this is something that we didn't see in the moment, but we're starting to see now. One of the missed opportunities that the church had over the last two years was to take authority over the spirit of fear in the earth. And we didn't do it. And you know why we didn't do it? 
Because I believe the church has been just as afraid of the pandemic as the world has been. And I think what's happened over the last two years, I think it's forced the church to somewhat have a little bit of a self-evaluation to realize, are we truly the church of Jesus Christ that know who we are? that walk in the authority and the power of God. We know truth. We know scripture. We can discern the deception that's coming. We have the ability to see what's going on politically. We have the ability to see what's going on economically. We have the ability to see what's going on culturally. We have the ability to see the, the social influences that's trying to condition the world to give into things that are becoming common to us and accepted to us and making things that we know that are against God's scriptures normal I believe that the church has almost become desensitized in some degree in the distraction. And we've come to realize that we don't have the position in Christ that we ought to be. And we, we are probably missing the moment. And so I think that it's, it's no secret and it's no surprise that the perilous times is something that the church is going to have to experience before we go through the, to the rapture and the great tribulation. Because I don't want us as a church or believers, specifically Parkway Life Church, I don't want us to think that this is a bunker, this is a, this is a shelter, we just come in to get rid of This is not where we come to get safe. This is where we come to get stirred and get equipped and get powered. We don't come here to hide. This is not where we come to get the world off of us and the influences of the world. This is not where we come to relax and get our minds off of the chaos. This is not where we come to get out of the chaos. This is where we come to get the revelation of God so that we will know when we walk out of here how to live. And we want to walk out of here and live it out. We come here to receive our orders and to get the authority of God and for the Lord to give us his word and scripture and interpretation of what's to come so that we will know what our assignment is. We are not to be bunkered in here and sheltered in here like a some kind of great bomb shelter of a spiritual and physical war that's getting ready to take place and we're just going to sit here real calm and soft and just hunker down until it all breaks out and the Lord takes us out of here if that's your mentality of the church part of your problems you got a spirit of religion on you and secondly you don't even realize the God that's on your side and the authority and the assignment he's got because listen you could have been born in any time of generation and God brought he, you and I we are living in this age because God intended for you and you and you and you and you and you from the oldest to the youngest God said I've got to work for you I've got a plan for you here we are let me let me let me come back to something here so where do we get the teaching of the even this tribulation period where's the seven years come from is that just something that, you know, a bunch of prophets of today got in conference and prayed and somebody heard the Lord say, well, there's going to be a seven-year period called the tribulation. Well, it is definitely, without a doubt, a biblical teaching for us. Now, a great part of this comes from the prophecy of Daniel. And Daniel gives us this, and I'm just going to show you this specific verse. Again, I'm probably going to create more questions than answers, and I hope so, because it's going to make you go and look at this even further. But Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 is probably one of the most important verses where we understand this. Now, you've got to understand that some of the things that's being said is said in, in, in context and in terminologies that sometimes can be confusing. For example, when we read this verse, Daniel 9, 24, a period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed over your people and your holy city. And here's the reason why. To finish the rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt and to bring an everlasting righteousness to confirm the prophet vision and to anoint the most holy place. What that is right there is that basically gives us in that one verse the description of what God plans to do in that seven year period of tribulation. And Daniel calls this a set of 70, 70 sets of seven, seven weeks, seven years. And so as we have learned, as Bible scholars have learned, to take this verse and then take other scriptures through the prophet Isaiah, through the prophet Ezekiel, through the book of Revelation, knowing the seven seals, the seven letters, the seven trumpets, and all these things, we understand that this is all a symbol of a seven-year period that's going to take place. And this is where we get this from. Now, these passages speak a lot about the first 42 months of the tribulation, which is called the, first, uh, the, the tribulation, the first three and a half years. 
And this is where we find what's going to happen in the first three and a half years of this time of tribulation. And, and a lot of this is seen in Revelation chapter 6. What gives us calls, it's called the seven seals of judgment. These are the seven seals that John saw when he was wrapped to road in vision. And he saw what was written in heaven that will be open and, and read to begin to pronounce the judgment on the earth and on the nations. Here's, here's what they are. Seal number one, the first seal. White horses, that's when the Antichrist comes to conquer. That's going to be in that seven year. Uh, the second seal is the red horse, open of the warfare, open, open warfare, warfare breaks out. Uh, third seal, the black horse, which is the world famine. Fourth seal, the pale horse, which is the death of one fourth on the earth. Can you imagine one fourth of humanity? The calamity of that one fourth of humanity will be killed, will die in that period of time. Fifth seal is martyrdom. Believers called uh, for vengeance. Sixth seal is the physical disturbance, which will be the earthquakes, the sun, and the blackout, and et cetera. These are part of it. The seventh seal it then initiates the trumpet judgments, which follow this specific passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 6. I know I'm covering a lot of things, and I'm creating more questions than answers, but I'm wanting you to see these are, this is the prophetic thing that John saw in the book of Revelation that describes what's going to be happening at this period of time of, of tribulation. And a lot of that's going to begin at the beginning of the first three and a half years. Now, these two specific passages that I'm going to read in just a moment speak about the end of the seven-year period. This is what it's going to look like towards the end. Revelation 11, verse 1 and 3. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. But exclude the outer courts and do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. This is the end of the three and a half years, of the seven years. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, that's three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. There's going to be the two prophets, the two witnesses that will come, and they will begin to witness and do the great works of miracle. They will have the anointing of God upon their life. They will be killed. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 and 8. The beast was given a mouth to utter prof to, to, uh, proud words and blasphemy to exercise its authority over the 42 months. This is the last, again, this is the three and a half, in, three and a half years of the end of the tribulation. It was given, uh, let's say, uh, it, 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 opened, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and to all those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people, specifically Jerusalem and Israel, to conquer them, and it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the creation of the world. So let me, let me explain this to you. This is, so, this is so rich for us to see. What we see happening here is that the end, the first three and a half years of this tribulation is going to be devastation. Think about it. Just the fact that there's going to be only God knows how many Christians are going to literally vanish just like that. It could be in a setting just like this. But all at once, all around the world, there will be a trumpet that will be heard in the ears and the hearts of every believer. That will be the trump of God that will sound. We will instantly, the Bible, John, or Paul talks about this in 1 Thessalonians, that those who are dead in Christ will be risen from the dead, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together in the clouds to meet them, with the Lord, and there we will be with the Lord forever in that moment. That specific moment when the rapture takes place, imagine this. If this is something that is prophetic to happen in our time, that will be something that has never, that will go far beyond any type of strange, unusual um, phenomena that, that the mind or humankind has ever experienced. You can only imagine the destruction. You hear the stories of maybe Christian pilots who were piloting planes and planes falling down. Imagine the mass destruction of people that are raptured. And I know that some people are thinking, and I've heard the arguments before, I thought God was a loving God. How could God allow such destruction to come in the earth? Why would God do such a thing? And I don't have time to even go in this, this part of the message. But God is a very loving God. In fact, while we see the judgment of God, we end with the mercy of God, where God still brings a great revival to gather as many souls as he can to come with him, to finish the redemptive work that he started through his son, Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something, because God is holy, God is just. And God reaches a point where he says, I will not tolerate the sin, the epidemic of sin in the earth. That is the greatest pandemic of every pandemic that's ever come to this earth, is the pandemic of sin. 
and God will bring an end to that, and he will bring a judgment, and he will bring a wrath that will come, and that's going to be poured out at the end. Now, there will be a period of time, as we just read. The Antichrist will become very evident in that middle of that period of years. Already, and there are so many people who believe that if we are in this time, think about this. The Antichrist, who will be a person, is probably living amongst us in the earth today. Whoever the Antichrist is, he is a physical being that is living in the earth today. The spirit of Antichrist is already at work. That's what's working in the spirit of Putin. I know some people are asking, is Putin the Antichrist? I don't know. I don't know if he's not. I don't know. But I just do know this. The spirit of Antichrist that is full of evil, that wants to bring an end to the godly things, that wants to destroy Christianity, specifically destroy the Jews, and destroy Israel, that spirit is in the earth. And I want to say this, and I don't have time to get in this, but as America, we need to be concerned right now because that spirit of, of not standing against the nation of Israel is already a spirit that is invading the leadership of this country, and that will, bring, that will remove the favor and the candlestick out of this nation and the protection of the favor of God. Listen, that's why voting and making sure, you say, well, you know, we're not voting for a pastor. I get that. But you need to understand when you're voting for a president, you're voting for governors, you're voting for leaders, you need to make sure that they have an understanding that we as a people and as a nation in America is always to stand with this nation, Israel. And if we ever turn our back on Israel, then I can promise you we will begin to reap the destruction of that decision. And don't... I've got a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Paul Francis Lanier. He was, he, he was a part of mentoring my life. And I've been speaking with him over the last couple of weeks. He just left to go to Israel just a couple of weeks ago. I've been following him on Facebook and seeing some of the things that he's been doing. And he's been speaking prophetically. He said something last year. I kept it because I believe he's true. He said that the Lord spoke to him. And he said that you will see in one day two major networks in the United States of America crumble and fall. Two major new networks will fall just like that in our day. These are the things that are being set up that will occur. This will be the difficult thing. And if we as a country are not aware that our leaders have to have a loyalty to the nation, to the people of God of Israel, then we are jeopardizing the favor of God in our own nation, in our own land. Let me, let me close by this. And I think I bring this back up front because I want us to see this and I want us to hear this. What is the purpose of the rapture? Why, why even have this? What is the motive of God for there to be this experience of the rapture? Well, one thing we see in Revelation chapter 3.10, he says, because you've kept my commands, you've command to preserve or to persevere, to keep moving forward, to press on and stay at it. I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the world to test those who dwell on the earth. In order for that to happen, that's why we have the rapture. It's also a consummation of the church on the earth. Look at these two verses here, 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 19. For what our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Hebrews 9, 28. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear the second time apart from sin for salvation. This, it fulfills God's promise to deliver his church from the wrath. God has made a commitment to his church. I'm going to rescue my people so that way when the judgment comes, the tribulation comes, I will rescue them and I will preserve them from this time of destruction. I, I want to just leave you with these verses to encourage you because I want you to see this. Number of verses, we're just going to read through them. Look at this, Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 7. And the Lord said to the, the angel of the church of Philadelphia, verse 10, because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the world to test those who dwell in it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 10. Wait for his, wait for his son, uh, wait, uh, wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 19. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not that even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? 
1 Thessalonians 3.13. So that he may establish our hearts, your hearts blameless in holiness before God the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. This is, this is at the time of the return of the second coming. 1 Thess- Thessalonians 4.17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Aren't you looking forward to that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, for God, this is it, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Jesus says in Luke chapter 21, verse 36, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. Or are they going to watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. Most of you know I was in Dallas this week and flew back last night. And Friday night while we were in our conference. One of the other guest speakers that was there was a gentleman who's been to Israel 48 times. Our conference was over at 1030 Friday night. Myself, the host pastor the conference speaker and his son-in-law and another gentleman from the church went to a restaurant. They had to throw us out because it was past midnight. And we sat there and I just, I could not stop asking him questions. None of us could. For the last 40 years, he's been studying scriptures and end times. And he's actually one of these, and I know there's there's a caution that we have to have when we, when we go this direction, but certainly... Numbers represent so much. We know that. The number seven, the number six, the number five. All the numbers represent. 40 days, you see the consistency. 10, 7, 40, 3, 1, 6, the number of man, 7, number of God. And he's, he just happens to be one of these that has an analytical brain that's just constantly crunching the numbers and looking at the timetables and trying to figure out or discern or get the revelation of, of the timetables. And he said something, I and mean, he actually gave reason. And I, I certainly don't have time to go into it. In fact, it was so much, I, I can't put it all together. I slept three hours at night because I stayed up in my hotel, thumbing through Bibles and looking at commentary and trying to make sense of everything he said. But the thing that he said to me that, that stirred me more than anything else, here was a man, I don't know him. I got to meet him this past week. Spent two days doing a conference with him. Here's a man, he's devoted to Israel and studying the scripture and learning both the Old and the New Testament. Prophetic man, prophetic voice in the earth today. He said, I don't know the time that the Lord's going to come. I don't know the day or the hour. Nobody does. He said, but I will tell you this. He said, I've been studying the timetable that God has set in the earth. And I begin to see the patterns and see the signs of the times, everything from the blood moons and all of these things that we hear so much about, but it's beyond us, so we don't even go there because it oozes out of us. I'll tell you this right now, and I'll say it anywhere. I believe that the rapture is going to take place before the year 2023. That's what he said. He said, and I've got my reason to believe it, Not studying, not based upon the urgency of the times that we're in, but because what I see in Scripture. He said, I believe that. But he said, you know, before 2023, well, that could be any moment. I'm like you. I sometimes get nervous when people put time. He said this. He said, keep your eye on September the 10th this year. I don't know. I don't know what that's all about. He tried to explain it, and by that time, I was on information overload, as probably some of you are right now. Everything was just oozing out as it was coming in. But I believe this. I believe that God is waking up the prophets in the earth today, and he's waking up the church, and he's waking up in his people, and he's getting his spirit into us so that we can be alive, and we can be ready, and we can be missional in this greatest hour that we have left to do the work that God's called us this great commission. So for you today, I don't know where you stand in all of this. I don't know if you are that person you are. You've allowed yourself to come as the prophet. The prophet Amos, I think it's in chapter 6, he, he talked about 
one of the conditions in the church would be what's called at ease in Zion. That's a description of meaning a spirit of complacency upon the church. That may be where your faith is right now. You're so tired. You're so frustrated with life. You've got some confusion with your relationship with God. And you literally don't want to know any about this. You just want an end to come and hope that you can get there. And that's not how God wants you to finish. But if you're here today, and if the rapture happens before you pick up the fork and eat your first bite of your lunch, you need to ask yourself the question, am I ready for this great, this great event? Are you ready? And the good thing is, before we leave, you're going to have that opportunity if you're not. So I want to ask you to stand with me, everybody, if you would, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, when I begin to look at my prayer list, I recognize that so much of what I'm asking you for is trivial in light of where we stand in time. Holy Spirit, you know the desires and the needs and the concerns of our hearts. But God, we want to know your desires and the concerns of your heart. Because that should overshadow any desire or need that we have in our own life. Change us in that place, God. Forgive us, God, that we have made our relationship and our petition and our request and our prayer with you more about what you can do for us based on what we feel rather than asking you, God, what can we do for you based upon what you feel and what you see need. Lord, I believe that if we will take that position, then those concerns in our life, you're just going to take care of anyways. We're going to see that it's trivial, but we're also going to see that you got it anyways. It's under your hair. It's under your hands. You're going to take care of it. So change us. And now, Lord, I pray right now for that person that's in this room or maybe multiple people in this room that if you came today or maybe their appointed time of death comes today, I pray, God, that they will call upon your name right now and they will ask you to be Lord and Savior of their life. And this is not, Lord, just so that we can escape eternal death, but God, also that we can experience eternal life right here on this earth and we can have the life and life more abundant regardless of how much time we have left. I pray, God, that they will ask you to be their Lord. I pray that you will break the power of Satan over their mind, over their body, over their spirit. I pray a spirit of deliverance will come over them and you will set them free. And I pray, God, that an incredible faith will come up, rise up inside of them. They will come alive. We confess you as our Lord. Do that right now. Just say, Lord Jesus. Everybody say, Lord Jesus, I confess to you that you are the one true way, the Son of the living God, and you are the only Savior of the world. And I thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for the remission of my sins. Because of you today, God, I have hope. And I put my hope, my confidence, and my trust is in you, Lord, in Jesus' name. You are my Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Aren't you glad God's going to be coming back soon? Give the Lord a praise. Now, I cannot confirm this, and I'm only going to tell you this because, as you can imagine, this has stirred up a lot in me. Where I'm at right now, I don't know if I'll be ready to preach this message Sunday. If so, I'm going to be answering the question, what is God's plan with America in the end times? This is a tough one. This is a really tough one because, quite honestly, when you start studying Scripture, you don't see America in it. When you start studying prophecy, you see the church. But there's some things I think that we're going to learn and see. And if I can get this finished, I'm going to be sharing a message this Sunday. Where does America fit in prophecy and in the end times? Will you be here for that? That'll be good. Will you be here this Wednesday night? We're going to video number 
7, I believe, six video 7, that will be here this Wednesday night for our teaching from Dr. David Jeremiah, video teaching. It's a one-hour service. Get here at 6.30. I promise you'll be out here at 7.30. If not, that's on you. All right. Hey, Brother Jim, come on up here. Close us and dismiss us in prayer. God bless you all. Thank you.